News Across the Galaxy presents The Midweek Show. I'm your host, Bryant Lowell's, and as always, my co-host, Edgar Zuniga. How you doing today, sir? I'm all right, man. I'm trying my best not to let the allergies get the best of me, but <clears throat> it's kind of hard uh, when you have pollen the size of small dogs flying around. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's pretty bad, you know, and having a small dog, go, you know, go up your nose and it's not good. But we have a very special guest here today uh, because there's a... Like I said uh, last week, Galaxy has two big tests. There was yep. one against LAFC, which didn't go so well, and then an even bigger test against Vancouver Whitecaps, who all of a sudden uh, have come to the top of the table. And it's it's a, I feel like it's a great thing for MLS. But to talk talk to us all about that, all the way from the frozen north, Nathan Durek. How's it going, fellas? <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> well, it's going good for both of our teams. I'll tell you that much. I uh, know. I mean, <laughs> last, I was going to, we were talking earlier. I mean, last time we talked last year, we were on the other side of the table. So it's it's nice to be talking and, you know, with a bit more positivity. Yeah, yeah. Um, but before we get into the match, um, there's been some new rules to MLS. Um, from Paul Tenorio's Twitter, MLS set to make changes to roster rules for summer window per sources. The options are three DPs, three U22s, or two DPs and four U22s with two million in GAM. Option two, two buyouts per season. Option three, max three million in GAM on transfer revenue per year. Oof. Gentlemen, these new rules to MLS. I'm going to ask you first, Nathan. What does this say for our league and what kind of landscape does it, does it paint moving forward? It's a very, very small step in the right direction. Um, w- I mean, we've talked about the decoupling of U22 and DP spots for a long time, right? It, it seemed very strange that they were the way they were paired, that one restricted what you could have in the other one. It, it, it's, it's a nice move. Um, I, I would like a little bit more freedom for uh you know front offices and recruitments to be able to to move but it feels like a little bit of a nod the the gam i'm neither here nor there i mean i'm honestly i'm kind of an advocate for getting rid of it entirely and, and allowing teams to buy whatever they want so long as you're staying within the salary cap in terms of what you're paying as in terms of transfers i mean do what you will i mean we're not just operating within an mls market we're operating in a global market I think the one thing that's the really, really interesting thing is having two buyouts. Um, I, I think that gives teams a lot more flexibility, especially when you're heading into an off season where you can start making or you can start planning your moves for the rest of an off season a lot earlier. And I think that's the one thing that's going to give teams a little bit more flexibility. It's not something that we're going to feel right away. I mean, these are going to come into fruition sometime in the summer transfer window. So not all of these we're going to feel the effects of right away, but that's the one I think that in the long run will have the most impact. Yeah. Edgar, how does this look to you? Obviously the more flexibility is the better thing for MLS. Um, Like uh, Nathan was talking about the the whole buyout thing. I think it's uh, such a big deal because you look at what happened with Minnesota United and Emmanuel Reynoso, their DP. And I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on with him, right? Like, he, it's a history of this behavior. Uh, and now uh, Minnesota has to decide, like, well, you know, what do we do? Are we going to stick with him? Are we going to bring him back, wait for him to get his stuff together? Or is he going to stay over there? Now they have the, you know, the, the option to do a buyout and start planning for the summer transfer window. In their case, Nathan, you were saying, you know, for the winter, these guys can start planning for the summer. That's very true. Un- unload this guy and who's been a troublemaker for them, unfortunately. Um, and focus on uh, continuing the, their, you know, their early season success and not he be, let him be uh, like so heavy on the books as the rest of the season winds on. Uh, so, yeah, more, more flexibility is, is obviously better. Uh, I wonder how this affects LA Galaxy because LA Galaxy has a lot of, uh, despite their, you know, their quick start, there's a lot of uh, depth pieces that they need, especially – and defense and up top uh, where the team is seriously lacking and we saw that against LAFC yeah and to add on to that buyout I mean if we would have had this um, years past 
Do you remember a player by the name of Giovanni Dos Santos? That was one that you could have bought Costa? out. Yeah, and Douglas <laughs> Costa. I mean, those are players you could have bought out early yeah. on in the season and then, you know, bring in more help, so to speak. One of my favorite things from this the new rule thing uh, is this that's making the league younger. I like this th these U twenty two initiative, whatever it is they're gonna call it now, uh, with the three three U twenty twos and two DPs, four U twenty twos. I mean, that's what you want in a league that's progressing. Uh, you want it to get younger. You want it to get better. And usually, when players come to this league, they're usually from South America. They can use this side, this MLS, as a springboard to go to Europe. And you bring in more youth, you're going to make the game more exciting, you're going to bring in more views, and I'm all for it. That's 100% thing that the league is missing. I mean, as you said, Nathan, more flexibility in the in the roster will be will be best with taking out that gam. But the youth, I like it. That's one of my, my favorite things of this new this new rule. I think the, the progression towards a younger league has been going on for quite a few years. You started to see it with a lot of teams and who they're bringing in as DPs. The U22 has always been a really, really nice mechanism because you can, it allows you to take a bit of a gamble, right? You can bring in players from elsewhere uh, and give them a bit of a try without it being such a significant hit against your salary cap uh, to a certain extent. Uh, it doesn't always work. I mean, I, I can take a look at the White Caps right now. We've got, we had two of our U22s that were sent out on loan. One of them is now, you know, obviously uh, been traded away uh, in uh, Kyle uh, or Kyle uh, Alessandre uh, doing amazing in Brazil, and then we have uh, Deber Casado in Colombia. Uh, whether or not he's going to be able to make a return, I don't know. He's doing pretty good in uh, Colombia as well. He might just choose to stay, but it doesn't hurt as much because you can take that take that chance. If it doesn't work out, you have those mechanisms that you know give you a little bit more flexibility. We, I know on our show, we had uh, Axel Schuster on, the CEO and sporting director of, of the Whitecaps, and he was saying that when we were talking about the possibility of any sort of roster change rules, that's all he was looking for. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to make wholesale changes. A little bit more flexibility. I mean, these guys that are in this position where all across all the teams in MLS, they understand the rules. They understand the mechanisms that they have in place and are able to work around them. Some of them can try and kind of game the system. We've seen that with a few teams, but <laughs> Miami. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to throw out any names, right? But having a bit more flexibility, I think, allows the teams that has financial clout to exercise it. Allows the teams that maybe are kind of in the middle of the pack or in the lower part of the pack to to be a little bit more creative in trying to make their teams, you know, move up the list. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um. Anything else before we move on to the next, Edgar? Unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, I was just like looking at my notes right here. <laughs> uh, I just wish that MLS uh, roster rules weren't so alphabet soupy, I guess you want to say. All that gam, tam, all that stuff. <laughs> For anybody that, that doesn't uh, live and breathe MLS uh, contract stuff, legalese, it's, it's like oh, it's all Greek to them, right? Like what is this gam tam stuff, and how does it apply to your teams? But uh, I think uh, if we if we get if we get to a more simplistic uh, method, I think it'll be a lot easier for for fans to understand what's going on, and also for teams to just focus on building teams instead of trying to do all this math in some back boardroom where they're, they're looking like Albert Einstein trying to figure out the theory of relativity there. Uh, so I'm all for it. Uh, just uh, make things simpler. And this, this I think, is a step in that direction. Yeah, I don't think and... you're ever going to get rid of all of the rules entirely. I mean, you, we're, <laughs> you take a look at North American sport in general. We're very, yeah. very different than the rest of the world in how we treat sport, how we treat transfers, how we, we have a whole trading marketplace. Uh, the roster rules, salary caps, that's something that we're accustomed to, not just from MLS, but other sports as well. Uh, in a weird way, I, I think you're going to start to see other leagues around the world, especially to do with financial hardship, hardships, FFP, things like that, they might start looking at MLS as a model to emulate to a certain extent. I don't think you're ever going to see other people try to come to fully, fully take a look at what MLS is doing and emulate that. I think you're, you would have full on mutinies, but a little bit. I think that's if anything happens, it might be that way and not the other way around. 
Yeah, and I think that's why I love MLS, just the parody of it. Because mm -hmm. these type of rules are in place so that the Galaxy is not winning every time because they have deep <laughs> pockets, right? Or Miami is not winning every time because they have deep pockets. And it, it creates great competition within the league. And it kind of, you know, makes people want to come to this league. Like, okay, we're not always going to suck. There's going to be a moment where we're going to be all right. And so I, I love this. Uh, if the world adapted it, I mean, then maybe we wouldn't see Real Madrid win every Spanish league. We wouldn't see uh, Manchester win every every Prem or whatever it is, and there'd be more competition. That's what you want as yeah. as a as a viewer of the sport. You want to see competition. You don't want to see just one team winning all the time. It gets well, boring. That's the thing. I was gonna. I was actually gonna uh, ask that question uh, because it, uh, I know a lot of people say, take the elephant in the room. They don't want to ask that question. Uh, because you see it in sports like uh, Formula One, for example, uh, which is so different from NASCAR. In NASCAR, all the teams abide by the same rules. They have to have the same uh, engines, the same uh, uh, specifications on the vehicles. So when they're out there, uh, the biggest thing is the quality of, of the driver and their crew. I mean, their crew, right? Their pit crew mm -hmm. and how the crew chief manages that team. So I felt like it's a better uh, test for me compared to Formula One, which I do love Formula One. I, I trust me, I love it, but I feel like it's there's a huge line between the haves and the have-nots, and you see that a lot in European sports as well, especially in football, soccer, right? Yeah. Uh, look at the Champions League; it's it's almost the same teams every year that are fighting for the top spots. You look at especially like Liga and. Uh, Premier League, it's always these two teams. I mean, it's even worse in the Bundesliga with Bayern. Although this year it looks like it's over because of the Harry Kane. Unless your name is Javi Alonso. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but yeah, I wonder <clears throat> if somebody uh, in Europe was to say, hey, why don't we implement this American standard right away? Like, oh, how dare you, America? <laughs> but at the same time, uh, how dare you mess with tradition? And you know there's going to be a serious pushback from uh, the, the teams that have the most power and the most money because they want to keep that consolidated within their little group. So, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a Fulham supporter, and I know I'll never see Fulham win the Premier League, but uh, <laughs> maybe one day somebody will say, hey, let's institute a salary cap. Well, not a salary cap, but let's institute some kind of system where teams that are near the bottom – get an opportunity to build a, a better team so that way they're not going in this constant yo-yo of relegation the one thing but, is you've started to hear in europe a lot more open talk about a salary cap now, forget all the other roster rules but about a salary cap and i think a lot of it is because you're having a lot a lot more teams that are failing uh failing clubs i mean we can talk about everton and points deduction we can talk about what's going on yeah. with nottingham forest Go further down the table. Look at what's going on with Reading. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, they're owned by a guy who has already taken two clubs in Europe and run them into the ground. They don't exist anymore. Uh, this it's it's a problem. Unfortunately, that's just going to get worse and worse and worse for the teams that don't have the financial means. And that's fine. You can make the argument, well, those that have the means will be able to go and play to the top. But if you're going to have a league where there's only four teams, that's not much of a league. Yeah, it gets boring. Yeah, competitive yeah. champions does get boring. You want to see the underdog every time, maybe have a chance at a well, title. Not not every time, but you want them to have <laughs> a every one of chance. our great sports movies is about <laughs> yeah, an underdog. It is. Right? <laughs> Americanize everything. Americanize the world. Yeah. No, I mean, but the underlying, I think the the underlying theme about the underdog having that is opportunities because it's they're given that opportunity. Like one of my favorite films of all time is Rocky, and. I mean, Apollo was such a mytholo it was such a, a, a mythical figure in that movie. He was such a powerful presence uh, as the, the champion of the world. And he says, you know, I don't want to fight, I don't want to fight some other guy that's like at the top of the food chain. I want to fight somebody who is a working class man, somebody who represents the people, uh, because I want to show that in America anybody has an opportunity to do that. And so that they they handpick Rocky and Rocky isn't necessarily a bad fighter. It's just he hasn't had the opportunity to get the proper training and the proper preparation to fight at that level. And that's what we're talking about, where you have these uh, these clubs, these franchises 
that maybe could flourish if they have the right amount of uh, funding and the right amount of preparation. Like a perfect example of that is Wrexham. A lot mm. of people fell in love with Wrexham because of the, you know, the, the the documentaries and the films and all that stuff and Ryan Reynolds. And, but what's to say they would have chosen some other team? Yeah. That that would that, that would be the darling of social media and uh, entertainment right now, not Wrexham. Yeah. So it just goes to show you you water this little plant that needs it, and it's gonna grow. It just you just gotta put it out there. So this is where American sports differs from uh, European sports and other parts of the world, where you give you give a little bit of water, a little bit of sustenance to these smaller teams, and they will grow. Unless you have an owner that's completely inept or just doesn't know anything about like what happened with Oakland, the Oakland A's, I mean, Sacramento yeah. A's, I mean, Las Vegas A's, whatever, those guys, uh, they, their owner is trash. And I'm afraid he might do something similar to the earthquakes. Um, uh-huh. A lot of people, have, you know, say like, hey, you know, those are our rivals. Hey, you got to take care of all the teams in this league. And I, I would hate to see the one, number one, the earthquakes move away from California again because there are traditional rivals. And number two, for them to always be constantly bid mid table because right now they're not doing well at all. You look, they're at the very bottom of the food chain. They're very, they're at the bottom of MLS. I don't want to see the earthquakes down there. I want to see them to rise up because I feel like when Galaxy has been really good, it's because they had a team like the earthquakes to push them. Yeah. Look at how many times Galaxy won MLS Cup and look at how San Jose Earthquakes was doing those years. They were they were there pushing the LA Galaxy along during those years. So um, I'm sure at, up in Cascadia, you have strong Portland, a strong Seattle, and a strong Vancouver. That makes for really intriguing football, right, Nate? It's, it's hugely exciting. We've already had Portland up at BC Place once this year, and it was a, a phenomenal match. I mean, we didn't come up. I'm trying to remember how did we do in that one. I don't think. Let me just take a quick look here. But when you have those uh, those rivalries, and they're they're what push you, right? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. When your rivalry is not doing well, whether it's your team or the other team, it kind of just diminishes the whole experience, uh, and it just doesn't. Mean, yeah, actually, Vancouver did come up uh, on Portland. They did win, but. Yeah, it's it, they push you. They push you. Yeah, you want to see your rivalries do well. You want to do better than them. But when they're doing right. well, it's it it does give you that added momentum. Yeah, yeah and, and it, that's where we can transition. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, to yeah. Um, the emergence of Vancouver, because uh, unless you follow the league closely, and uh, I know Brian and I do, and so do you. Obviously, you you cover yeah. the cast. But last year, and even the year before, we saw the seeds of something there, and. We're like, these guys are on the verge of doing something great because they're starting to build it, but you, you don't see it just yet. But there's like flashes of it. But it seems that this year, the Caps had something special about them. Can you tell us uh, what happened? Like, what's been the biggest <laughs> thing that spurred this huge... Well, how much time do you got? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. Years, uh, about, I'm trying to remember how many years ago. It was about four years ago. They brought in Axel Schuster from Mines over in the Bundesliga to be the new sporting director and CEO of the club. Uh, and he was brought in with the mindset of basically take it by the reins, tell us what we need to do, and let's move that way. And I, I it, it, the feeling is, is that he wasn't told to reform the club overnight. He was told that you've got a club that is hurting uh, both on the pitch and off the pitch. There was a lot of uh, problems that the Whitecaps were embroiled in um, that have really come to light over the past number of years uh, off the pitch as well. So it was a matter of kind of rebuilding this club and rebuilding a club that can regain the trust of its fan base. So one of the things that the Whitecaps didn't have when he came over is the Whitecaps never had a scouting department. The Whitecaps scouting department at the time was take your head coach in the off season. Tell him to go on a mini tour and just watch games around the world and then uh, figure out which players you want. That was white cap <laughs> scouting, right? Like it was, it was kind of nuts. It's, it's basically, I, it was, it was the Todd Bowley scatter effect of put a dart, you know, a uh, dart board on the board and throw a dart to see which, uh, you know, high number player you want to bring in the Chelsea, right? It was that, but much lighter and with less money. They brought in a scouting department. They brought in a, a recruiting department. They've got those guys to actually work and figure out, okay, where do we want to go? 
okay, Vancouver, we're on the West Coast. Who are the kind of players that we want to bring in? What are the untapped markets around global football that maybe we can look at? Yes, we have had a big commitment about bringing in players from South America. What about Asia, right? We've got an entirely untapped market in Vancouver uh, and we've got leagues in Asia. You take a look at South Korea and Japan and what they've been doing with their domestic leagues. I mean, Japan's domestic league has increased the number of teams that Japan has added professionally over the last five years. Hands down, it's the, the, the biggest growing league or league structure in the world. So, you know, that's an untapped market where you can bring players that are now high quality players over to MLS and give them a pathway or they can stay here. They ended up firing one coach um, who, now DeSantos, Marco DeSantos, who's now moved over to uh, LAFC uh, and is an assistant down there. But they brought in the, the person they had hired originally to be their youth uh, development coach and a director of methodology, made him the interim. And all of a sudden, he started winning things. He had the Whitecaps almost dead last, I think, when he, when they brought him in in August to making the playoffs. And it was little things like that of kind of getting everything right behind the scenes before they started to take a look at what do we want to do on the pitch? Okay, we need a designated player that not only is going to be here, but he's going not going to act like a designated player, right? He's going to be the workhorse of the team. They targeted a player like Ryan Gull. It took over a year working with him to bring him over. We need a guy that can uh, basically hold the midfield and you know clean up all those loose balls and, and help us with quick transitions. Andres Kubas took another long, long time to bring him over uh, what and bring him over and uh, get him uh, set up in Vancouver. They started targeting players um, with the mindset that if we don't get them initially, we might be able to get them later. And they started to build lists of what do we want to do? Having someone like Benny Sartini as the head coach, I mean, he used to coach coaches in the, the American uh, soccer program. So he came with a bit of a mindset of what, what can I do? And he was also another very global character in you know that he uh, was coaching in Italy uh, he was able to speak a whole bunch of languages. So the Italian coaching federation or uh, football federation in Italy started sending him around the world to go and learn and teach other pe people about Italian football. He started doing the same thing in North America before he came to the Whitecaps. They started building individuals that they felt could work as uh, a cohesive unit. And they didn't do it overnight. They started building things little by little by little. They started taking a look around within MLS. Are there players that we believe are undervalued in the teams that they are right now? That led them to people like Brian White, led them to people like Tristan Blackman, uh, people that they could build. They started building through uh, the draft, bringing in players uh, like Ryan Raposo, who's now become a veteran on this team and is really, I mean, he's doing phenomenal this year. But he hasn't always been that way. They started retraining players like a Raposo to fit in within the system. You know, Danny doesn't like wingers, but he likes wing backs. Well, you want a wing back that's going to be offensive. So why don't we move them back? And then they started looking at their own academy. Uh, players that maybe join the academy later on in their age, like an Ali Ahmed, or players that have come up through the academy and have been able to find spots here and there through the team. Little by little, and it's probably taken a good three years. I mean, Sartini just signed a brand new contract in the offseason for another couple of years. So it's not a project that was instantaneous, but it has built over time. And, and for the last three years, the Whitecaps have slowly increased their presence in the Western uh, Conference standings. They have now become a team where we just want to make the playoffs. Well, they started doing that. Okay, now making the playoffs isn't just what we want to do. That's now the benchmark. We need to do that every year. What's next? Now, well, now we want to be able to progress. We want to win a playoff series. They haven't been able to do that yet, but they're working towards that. Canadian Championship, well, we want to make it to the finals. Well, not only have they made the finals, but they've won back-to-back -back championships. So, you know, things are working in that regard. I think they're not the finished product yet. And I mean, honestly, no team is the finished product they're constantly changing but they're about one or two pieces away of being a very very quality and entertaining
club to watch. They're already entertaining, but if you added a couple of more pieces, I don't know what their ceiling would be. That's a, and this all plays into what the MLS rules is able mm -hmm. to give the, the teams. And this is one of the things that I like about the MLS. And I'm of the opinion that you don't need to bring in big stars to have a competitive team and to win titles. Yeah. You know what brings in the people if you win titles? It doesn't matter the name on the back of the jersey. Yeah, I'll fill in seats for a little bit. But if you're winning constantly and constantly and actually having a plan where you progress year by year, how Vancouver has been doing, you're going to fill in the stadium regardless. And on top of that, you're going to be competitive. And that's if what I like about in, these type of things. Yeah. If you bring in a player uh, for like your marquee player, it doesn't need to be a name. But if he understands the program, if he understands the project and that it's not going to happen right away, they can become that named player for your team, which is Ryan Galt. When he came to Vancouver, not a lot of people knew who he was. He was this Scottish guy that did good through the Dundee Academy and then kind of got forgot about in Portugal. But you bring him over, he gets a new lease on life. He starts to understand what his role is and what they, the role that they want him to get in two, three, four years. And now you can start building a team around that and he becomes the face of a franchise. He doesn't need to be the one right away. I don't think Vancouver's ever going to bring in a player like that where they're going to be a marquee player and you're going to buy his jersey simply because of the name of the back from day one. It's going just to be a, a player that you need to buy into it. Just a quick question. Just just please let me know. Does yep. uh, Vancouver Whitecaps, do they have the discovery rights to Kylian Mbappe? Because discovery rights, you know, <laughs> that, that magical <laughs> word, right? I mean, <laughs> SKC had discovery rights to Cristiano Ronaldo. And then we hear that LAC has discovery rights to, uh, to Giroud. So... Is I there don't something know. That you, have, you haven't told uh, us yet? Yeah, I've heard that too. I, uh, <laughs> I think if they had the discovery rates to Mbappe, it's going to amount to a whole lot of nothing. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. We'll sell them when Mbappe decides to come over here when he's 36 years old, right? There you go. But uh, sorry. yeah, sorry to I, you. <laughs> I think the only time he'll ever step foot in Canada is if France ends up playing up here in the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. Never you never know. know. Big things can happen. <laughs> you never know. Stranger things have happened. Right? <laughs> he might have a game in a BC place and be like, I, I just like it here. I'm going to move here. <laughs> yeah, why not? It's beautiful, right? Yeah. Until you um, get to the winter and it's just rain for you know five months a year. <laughs> <laughs> just send him up to Whistler for a week. He'll love it. Yeah, that's true, right? See if he uh, <laughs> loves skiing or snowboarding. Edgar, <laughs> I know I asked Nathan why they've been so good. Will you ask them why they're so good? Why is the LA Galaxy in the position they are? I know we've had this conversation on the show, and you're you're strong on your stance on saying that the team has played teams that have been either injured or it's just been back scheduling. Why do you yeah. think they're still in in this position that they are, though? Well, I mean, like I said, uh, I've been saying it from the very beginning. Um, Galaxy has benefited from teams that have had uh, either a tough schedule or have had freak injuries to players to keep players uh, the day of or before or during that week. So uh, a lot of those teams have had to work, uh, work out a way to try to slow down paint sale and some of the other new additions to this team, like uh, Gabriel Peck and a resurgent uh, uh, Brugman and uh, Fagundes was having a fantastic year. All these players and including Mark Targado, have contributed to the LA Galaxy season to the where they are right now. Uh, but I felt that they hadn't had a real good test uh, until they played LAFC and Vancouver. The reason I say that, because even though LAFC has a laundry list of injuries and they have a lot of issues that we saw, uh, Boanga is not the same guy he was last year. He He's a mess. Uh, and like... I I was uh, chatting with one of the LAFC pods and they were like, we don't know what the hell's wrong with him. He's just, he's just, I don't know. He's not the same. And we saw that <laughs> he had this amazing sitter. I mean, he has to tap in. He, he threw that all the way out to the King Boulevard. And um, so, but even then LA Galaxy had a really hard time because like we said on the Sunday show, it feels like teams had developed some kind of blueprint to slow down a paint sale. And to make things very difficult for uh, Ricky Pouge and first of the other players, and Galaxy being a a team that 
works really hard on, on possession and distribution of the ball. If you put a body on Ricky Pooj and you pester him constantly and you knock him around, it throws him off. So they, they, they really depend on that kind of finesse, being able to pass the ball around, distribute it. And Ricky Pooj gets so frustrated. He tries to do the most difficult things that make this cross field pass. And all you do is just hit somebody that's near, near you or maybe turn around and pass it back to somebody. Sometimes, you know, you, you got to pass back and you run into position and you get open and then you, it opens up the offense. But Ricky, <clears throat> and you know, the conversation always boils down to him because he's at the center of this offense and the center of this team. And a lot of conversation has been had uh, since the, the loss in El Trafico about what Ricky's role is and whether or not um, – he is to be blamed for the Galaxy's woes when they lose or what his plaudits are when he wins. Well, the thing is this. He, I feel like he tries so hard to be the man when all he has to do is make things simple. Some of the better players in this league, the ones that distribute the ball well, are good at what they are because they delegate. They pass the ball to their teammates and then it allows them to get open and move into positions and – that way you can dictate the pace of the game. He has players that are competent. That's the thing. Um, maybe Ricky thinks that he's the only one that can do these things, but do you have players on the Galaxy like Martha Gatto, Gaston Brugman, and even Joseph Pinto, we've seen him distribute the ball pretty well on the wing. Gabriel Peck can also do that. These are all players that can do that. Make things easier for himself, so that way it makes things easier for his teammates, and it takes some of that pressure off the defense. And so why is Galaxy where they are right now? Just because of that. They benefited from uh, a schedule that had them facing teams that were not at their best. And that's good for them, right? You want to win those games, and that's fantastic. But now they're facing, you know, they faced LFC, who was really hurting for a win. And I said it. I said, you never underestimate a wounded animal is backed into a corner because they will snap at you. And LFC did. And I was like, and now that you here you have Vancouver, a resurgent Vancouver Whitecaps that's flying. This is a great test for Galaxy. They have a really difficult time playing up at BC Place. And let's see how resilient this team is. Because as of right now, I think the best they have played was in that second half against Sporting Kansas City. And if they can somehow bottle that and distribute it over the course of 90 minutes, then maybe we can say, okay, they're better than we expected. But we'll see. Well, see, like I said, this is a test right here. This is a big test. Yeah, a, a very tough yeah. test. And uh, something you said on, on Monday, I mean, on Sunday, was it along the lines of out of the grill and straight into the fire with the LA Galaxy? Yeah, out of the out of the fire and into the frying pan. There you go. And so uh. <laughs> um, this is where I want to ask Nathan, because, you know, you hear us talking about LA Galaxy and you, you've seen us chatting, right, on, the, yep. on our little group chat there about how I keep saying, you know, we're not as good as, we, as people think we are. What are the optics, though, from from your from your point of view, and then you hear us talking about them? What does that make you think? You mean like from someone on the outside looking in at, at the galaxy? Yeah. The galaxy, the galaxy is a strong team going forward when they don't have the weight of the world on their shoulders, right? When I think you're right that there's so much that runs through Puj that when he gets thrown, it affects so much of the team. He is one of those guys that, for as good as he is, especially technically, it, it sometimes feels like he puts the weight of the world on his shoulders. It, it's, it's, he sometimes looks like he has this mentality of, I've got to do everything. And the problem is, is when he feels he has to do everything, he doesn't utilize all these other pieces around him. Uh, which are, I mean, LA Galaxy is a quality team. You've got uh, a well-built team. Like you said, there's still a few pieces away, especially when it comes into depth. But for a starting 11, you've got a team. When when you don't have that expectation, or if LA is able to, to get up to a, an early lead, that, that weight of expectation is gone. People can pray freely. Uh, there's not that that mindset that's working against them rather than the other team working against them. I, I feel that sometimes the galaxy can be their own worst enemy. Um, 
whether that happens, I don't know. Uh, you guys would be able to speak better of what your record is, you know, home versus away. So I don't know if that kind of plays into it. In MLS, it usually seems that it does. Um, but I, 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 th I think the mentality is, especially for Whitecaps, is the same way that you see the Whitecaps. This is a big test. This is a big test, not only because these are two teams that are doing very, very well early in the season. These are the teams that are number one, number two in the West, right? Uh, this this is an early test of what the end of the season could look like. We don't know. There's still a ton of games to go. We're not even close to having that conversation. But I think it's it's in, it's in the back of people's minds of this 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 could be the footprint or the 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 blueprint of what the rest of the season looks like. Yeah. Uh, well, the LA Galaxy take on. The Vancouver Whitecaps this Saturday, April 13th at 7.30 p.m. Let me give you guys some odds and win probabilities. Google has Vancouver at a 47% chance of winning, 24% chance of a draw, and 29% of the LA Galaxy winning. On DraftKings, they have Vancouver at plus 100, the draw at plus 280, and the LA Galaxy at plus 205, which is telling me that it does not seem like the LA Galaxy are going to go away and steal three points because it seems like it's impossible to get three points in BC place for this LA Galaxy. Uh, you mentioned, Edgar, earlier yeah. that the last time that they won was in 2021. Yeah. I have a bunch of stats here for you. Go so ahead. People that want to know because... Uh... So across all competitions, uh, LA Galaxy and Vancouver Whitecaps have played 39 matches. Uh, Vancouver has won 15. Galaxy has won 16. Eight draws, so very even. Uh, the match is going to be played at BC Place, uh, where uh, uh, Vancouver has won eight times. Galaxy has won four with five draws. Uh, the last six times these teams have played each other, Vancouver has won three. LA Galaxy has won one and with two draws. And anybody wondering, the last time Galaxy beat Vancouver was at the dig, and that was a 5-2 to two thrashing on October 14, 2022. And the last time the Galaxy beat the Caps at BC Place, you have to go back woo, that long time ago, 2021, June 24. <laughs> it was a 2-1 to one win, uh, which uh, I'm sure shocked us at the time. Like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so what does it mean for LA Galaxy? It means that they got their work cut out for them. Uh Playing at BC Place has always been a challenge for Galaxy. It doesn't matter how good the team has been. Um, and I'm sure this time around, it's going to be just as just as challenging as ever, which is why I said this is the ultimate test, especially at this point in the season. Um, so, Nathan, we want to know, what do you think LA Galaxy will have to do to break down the caps and maybe steal three points, maybe come out with a draw? Find a way to break down uh, Vancouver's defense. Their defense this year has been very, very strong. They've only allowed six goals against in uh, in six games. Uh, I think right now that's tied for second best in the league in terms of uh, goals against. Um, they have a back three that has now played uh, a full year together. All, all the th of the three main starters. They've also brought in depth into the back three. Um, especially one of them, uh, one of the players they brought in, uh, Ufik from Norway, who got his first start last week and looked like he'd been playing with them for a full year as well. You're, it's going to be difficult to break them down because in order to even get to the back three, you got to get past Andreas Kubas. And that guy doesn't let anyone <laughs> by him. He's, the, he's a, a diminutive uh, defensive midfielder, but he plays like he's 10 feet tall. I, I have no other way to put it, but he is he is a workhorse. And I think that's the one thing that you have to look at the Whitecaps is while they might not have the flashiest names in the world, as a team, this team plays. Uh, there, there's no one bigger on the team than the team itself. And I think that's very, very reflective when you actually get to watch them over a certain period of time. If if you want to be able to break down the Whitecaps, uh, I think you don't worry about them going forward and, and scoring goals. you got to get past their defense, and you've got to figure out a way to do that and break them down. Because 
if you hesitate, if you come at them with you know a little bit of trepidation, it's not going to work. Who do you think uh, the Whitecaps are going to have uh, on Ricky Puj yeah, to pressure him as he gets around the field? Um, I think it's going to be a, a few because when the Whitecaps defend, they defend from multiple lines. They don't just have uh, they they love one v ones going forward. Defensively, they try to avoid it. Um, Puj, what side does he normally play on? He's right in the middle. Right He's right in the middle. So that's Kubas' cool job right there. That's cool. Kubas. <laughs> uh, depending on what side he floats, uh, you might see someone like all if all if Ahmed starts, you might see him there as well because Ahmed is a guy who absolutely loves to take on players. Uh, Watch Ali Ahmed when he plays. When he's got the ball, he looks like he is a half a step away from falling flat in his face. But he, I don't know how he does it, but he can get around. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how he does it, but in my mind, I, I feel like he's about to need a nose job. I still remember, by the way, the, that, that failed Panenka by Ali Ahmed, right? Was it him? <laughs> oh, my God. I can't, I, 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 this, it's, it's like ingrained in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Um. The way the Whitecaps are playing this year, the way they have set up structurally, uh, especially going forward, it feels like they have built their tactical uh, system around a player like Ali Ahmed. Uh, they're very, very dynamic going forward. You'll always see like when when it's in the defensive phase, they always drop back to a very, very set formation. It's always going to be three at the back, two wide guys to make sure that no one's come down flanks, and then they choke the middle. It's always going to be the same. Going forward, it's going to be different depending on the pieces they put in. Um, I am curious on who the Whitecaps are going to play as their front three. They have uh, White and Gold, guaranteed. Uh, yep. White hasn't played the last couple of matches because he was on a concussion protocol. He has been cleared. He's ready to go. He's been training fully. I think he's going to start again. It's going to be interesting if they decide to go with uh, either one of our two new guys in Fafa the Coat. Or uh, Demir Krylak. Uh, Picoult has done phenomenally since he came in. He was one of the guys, and I'll be the first to admit, I didn't see how he was going to fit. He's fit beautifully. Yeah. And then Krylak, we know what he's done in the league. <laughs> I mean, he's we done know. phenomenal. I mean, uh, yeah. RSL kept sending messages overall our way saying, you got a guy. You got a guy that's going to be good. He's intelligent. He is wildly intelligent. He knows where he needs to be. He doesn't have the legs that he used to, and that's very evident. But if he is intelligent enough to get into his positions where he doesn't need to rely on bursts of speed, yeah, he can be a he can be a guy. The only problem is when you play someone like Krylak, Krylak plays kind of at the top of an offensive triangle, which tends to separate gold and white. And any sort of separation between them. I mean, you saw what they did last year. They were the best offensive pairing in the league. Any sort of separation between the two, they kind of, they, they, it's almost like they don't quite know yet how to operate yet. They'll get there, but it's still early in the season and they're trying to figure it out. When you have Paco, White gets to be at the top. And that the pairing between Gold and White is already there. And then Paco is just, I mean, he's fitting in perfectly. I think last year with Nashville, he had five goals all season. He's got three already for the Whitecaps. Mm. So he's he's leading the charge for the Whitecaps. The the That's a powerful I was going to ask offense. you where the goals were going to come, by the way. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got the one thing is, is the Whitecaps are scoring by committee. They have, I think they have more goal scorers than any other team in the league right now. Uh, and they've got quite a few. Of those that are starting, to, they've got White, Occult, and of all people, Ryan Raposo with double digits and goals. Or not double, uh, sorry, multiple goals, not double digits. But yeah, the thing is, is goals can come from anywhere. They, I'm pretty sure I saw, it was uh, just posted earlier, is that they've got more goal scorers than any other team right now. And that's one of the things that scares me. Uh, the LA Galaxy <laughs> yeah. has some deficiencies on the defensive side. Edgar, same question to you. How are the Whitecaps going to beat us if they end up beating us at BC Palace? Oh, my goodness. Set pieces. Yes. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. <laughs> yes. Set pieces. And um, when uh, if you if you crowd uh, Ricky Puj or knock him around a bit, 
he is prone to making very costly turnovers. You've seen him do it several times. I think one of the most uh, egregious ones was the one against St. Louis City where he went all the way to the back to retrieve the ball instead of dribbling up, and they put a man on him immediately. And he he pretty much gave it up to um, to St. Louis, and then he tried to get really cute and backheel the ball out. I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and St. Louis punished us. Uh, but yeah, Ricky Puj, as as good as he is, I mean, you want to give him his flowers and all that, but as good as he can be, he makes some very costly turnovers. And and that's not just him too. Some of, we've seen Alec Oxy when they're pressured, they will make turnovers. But more than anything, God, if they can figure out some way to practice set pieces, maybe <laughs> just maybe they wouldn't be giving up so many goals. They've given up eleven goals this season, which to me is a really bad i think five or six of them have been on set pieces so well yeah. the white caps and their uh destruction of toronto uh last week one of their goals at the very end of the match was uh, a pretty nice set piece from uh, veselinovic so oh. they have done it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, another another thing is uh the galaxy's uh defense i see the galaxy defense is kind of hurting right now uh, we just, uh, I looked up the injury report. Uh, Eric Zavaleta is still out. Uh, he's one of our center backs. And that means that Martin Cáceres, uh, who is back for this match, um, better be careful. He doesn't get a yellow. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, gets ejected or for some reason gets hurt again because Galaxy is actually, there's no depth at all on, at center back because the other center back is Jalen Neal and he's been out for a long, with a long term injury. So I don't know. I know Galaxy had gotten a player from Colombia, and I don't know if his name is Garces. I can't remember his first name right now. Emiro. Emiro Garces. Emiro Garces, yeah. I'm not sure if they figured out his visa to get him in the U.S. I'm not even sure if they figured out his visa to get him into Canada. So uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he's probably not going to be available. And if he is, you know, nice little <laughs> golf clap for front office. But, uh, yeah, it, there's hopefully uh, Martin Cáceres is, is healthy enough to go the full 90 because I have no idea who they're going to who they're gonna bring in. Uh, although Edwin Cerrillo, uh, one of our mids, he did a fantastic job at center back considering he's a small dude. But, uh, yeah, uh, pressure, the, pressure the defense, pressure uh, uh, Ricky Puj into making uh, mistakes. And I think Vancouver is going to – if they do that, they'll they'll just run over the galaxy. This is one of the things, though. I don't think the LA Galaxy is going to come out as flat as they did against LAFC. Uh, seeing that they're going to play a very competent Vancouver team, uh, it feels like Vanny and company are going to be able to try to come out with a game plan to not play as bad as they did last week. Um, either way, it's going to be a tough match against Vancouver uh, just because of the weapons they have on the offensive side. Um where we could probably take some advantage is probably on our wings. Uh, I know Nathan and I had a discussion about playing three in the back. Uh, when you play three in the back, those wings tend to be open. And if somehow we could get in those spaces in the wings and take advantage of that, uh, I think we could probably do some damage. This is going to be another good match. Let's do some predictions. Uh, Nathan, I know you guys are the home team. Um Yeah. You guys are in first place. You're seeing a wounded LA Galaxy. And like uh, Edgar mentioned earlier, a wounded animal, if you corner it, is going to snap back. Uh, how do you think it's going to go down this weekend? Well, uh, I mean, the thing is, is for as leaky as as the Galaxy are defensively, you're still scoring. So I, I don't see, I don't think it's going to be as easy a contest as you you might think. I think it's still going to be a difficult job for the Whitecaps to do. I do see them coming out on top, and I'm going to say 2-1. Fair. Edgar, same question. My prediction is that I'm going to have some Timbits and some Tim Hortons the moment I step on Canadian soil. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going out stuff. there. Hell, yeah. Yeah, everybody <laughs> listening to this later on, if you see Edgar, <laughs> buy him a beer. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm a Molson, baby. Um, I'm hey, also, Molson's uh, owned by, by Americans now, so. <laughs> Ooh, okay, never mind. Never mind. Forget it. <laughs> Give me something from Moose Jaw then. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely, I'm going to have some poutine at the stadium because that's what I had last time, and it was it was, it was was pretty good. You know, I figured, you know, stadium 
fair. You know, it's, it's hit or miss. And I had some poutine. And I was like, eh, it wasn't so bad compared to the one I had at a restaurant earlier in the week. But um, my prediction for this game, um, you know, I, I, I like to be positive, but I'll call it like I think it's going to be. I think uh, if Galaxy manages to score early, it'll be a lot, it'll be easier for them. Like Nathan was saying, you know, get on the, get on the score sheet early. Yeah, you know, put take some of that pressure off. But uh, if that doesn't happen, I think it's uh, Galaxy is having a difficult time. It'll be another difficult learning experience for them. It's always been difficult up at BC Place. Uh, I think earlier the question was, how is Galaxy on the road right now? They played four matches on the road. They have two wins. They just lost one, okay. at, at, you know, against LAFC, which was technically not on the road, but yes, it's on the road, whatever. Yeah. Now they, they go to Vancouver. Uh, I say uh, Vancouver wins three to one. Uh, those set pieces are gonna are still gonna be the Achilles heel of the team. I think uh, that that might affect the the score if we get a decent referee who's not gonna swallow, you know, the whistle. And Ricky Pooch is getting thrown around the field more often than not. I think it'll it'll take some of the some of that pressure off of him. It'll make, make things easier, maybe a more respectable two to one, like Nathan said. But uh, I see it as a three to one. Vancouver wins. Galaxy comes home with a lot of question marks, a lot of upset fans, but learning experience that I think will make them better because pressure makes diamonds. So yeah, oh, there it is. Well, I'm gonna be the middle mm-hmm. guy. I'm gonna say one one. Uh, I know the LA Galaxy just lost to. Their city rivals in LAFC, and they're going to want to get back on track. Um, a, a perfect test for them, too. And it's going to be really tough. But just so I could be on the optimistic side, because <laughs> this is a Galaxy podcast with our guest, Nathan, from Vancouver. I'll keep it in the middle. 1-1 one, one seems fair to me, and I'll take it all day. 1-1, <laughs> one, one, I think, would be really, really good for, for Galaxy, especially given the record at BC Place. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um well, that is it for our conversation today. Uh, thank you again, Nathan, for joining us and having these uh, intellectual talks and not much banter today. But maybe there'll be some banter <laughs> after the match. Uh, where can the people find you and your podcast and everything that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are the Terminal City FC podcast. Uh, you can find us uh, Twitter, Terminal City FC. Uh, Spotify, all your places you go to check out your podcasts. Uh, we are there. Covering white, not just white caps, men's and women's national teams for Canada, soccer news around the world. Uh, myself, N. Durek, D U R E C, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my partner is Joshua Ray, R E Y 00. And uh, yeah, happy to have you. Thanks again, yeah. guys. Yeah, Edgar, where can they find you? Yeah, you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter, X, whatever it's called these days. Yeah. As uh, Edgar <laughs> It's Nack, still which- Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Edgar Nags, right? You can look for it as Edgar Nags, or you can just go N A underscore G S. <laughs> and you can find uh, me. Bryant. You can find me as Bryant Nags on Instagram and Twitter slash X. And also, there is a rumor of the Canadian Women's League Hockey League, right? So tune for that because I actually I'm interested. I want to see them fight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, it's it's good hockey. And then actually, uh, this time next year, you should have a. Uh, a professional women's soccer league in Canada already started up too. Oh, beautiful. That's yeah. awesome. Well, that does it from all of us here at News Across the Galaxy. From Edgar, Nathan, myself, we are out of here. And as always, keep on nagging.